So I just bought a, uh, some socks and a shirt from a company based in Norway called Heli Hansen, double H logo. And I did that because over the weekend I went down to Santana Row and there was a store, a very famous store, uh, selling outdoor gear and backpacks and so on. Very popular with the teenage crowd, especially teenage uh, women. And, you know, outside the store, they have a couple of small stickers of the Swedish flag. And if you actually know history, looking at the Swedish flag should make you upset because it's not actually associated with the Nobel Prize anymore. The Mr. Nobel may have been Swedish, but he actually gave the award to Norway to administer. But not only that, but the fact of the matter is that the Swedes were supplying both the Allies and the Nazis during World War II. And one of the reasons that they are so good at security today, including cybersecurity, is because they were supplying both sides. In other words, they didn't take a stand based on principles. And you'll notice a large overlap in not only language, but culture between the Germans and the Swedes today. Um, just, just look up the word welcome in German and Swedish. That's just one example. And it's just remarkable how advertising, which, is, which can be a form of propaganda, has made it so that we look at the Swedish flag and we associate it with, I suppose, the Nobel Prize, which again is administered in a different country, and with human rights and feminism, et cetera, et cetera. And it should make you think that the reason that we have been convinced that the Swedes or the Swedish government are just historically is because of propaganda, which is part of war, especially in the lead up to war. But how far do we want to go down this path? The Volkswagen car, the Jetta, was reinvented again as a car popular with teenagers, especially females. Well, it turns out the Volkswagen was created under Hitler's government in Germany. When you drive a Volkswagen, you are on some level benefiting from the Nazi government and the government that went to war and obviously would benefit from a car whose parts would be easily fixed or interchangeable, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the reasons that we have advertising, one of the reasons that we have propaganda is in some way because we want to forget the past. Not only because of that desire, in other words, to move forward, but because we have to forget the past on some level in order to move forward and create a, and sever a link between the injustices of the past and the prosperity potentially of the future. That's one way to look at it. Well, it turns out that the joke's on me. The company Heli, Han Heli Hansen is actually no longer associated with Norway. It was bought out, I believe, by Canadian Tire, which makes sense because tires are a byproduct of oil, or petroleum, I should say, and it makes sense that Norway, which was given the oil in the region and which has a trillion dollar sovereign wealth fund as a result of controlling the oil in the region, that actually makes sense. That a tire company would take over or have substantial business contacts in Canada and Norway between the two countries. And that's where you start to realize that everything we're looking at today, whether corporate or governmental, is in some way tied to the past, especially World War II, if you live in any country with a substantial Western presence, which would include the English language, Western media, etc. And that the products that you see 
may look diverse, but ultimately work their way backwards to World War II. You're looking at, look at a Toyota or a Honda. That's the product of manufacturing processes put into place after World War II, when the Americans helped build up Japan. There's a specific process actually that Toyota came up with that became famous because it was so efficient. And that's the reason why you look around, when you really understand history, you understand that it's what you don't see that really helps you understand where you are. And so remember that the Russians also, the Soviets also won World War II, but we don't see any Soviet products here. We don't see, for example, a Lada car, L-A-A-D. You see them in Cuba, you see them in Eastern Europe, but not here. Odd, until you, because again, these are people that were on the same governments that were on the same side. And it's a bit odd when you realize that we're told that our dollars or our currency that we spend matters. In other words, we're making a choice when we spend money on something, on a product. But if it all goes back to the same trading partners under the same regulations and rules that harken back to World War II, then maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe the joke's on all of us. That includes people who join the military today because technology has made it so that we no longer benefit from an individual holding a gun crossing enemy lines. We have this, you know, remote surveillance, we have drones. These old movies of gunmen in trenches no longer applies. And because of that, if you're overseas serving in anyone's military, particularly in the military of the United States, the fact of the matter is that you're bait. You're there as part of an overall deterrence scheme so that the United States can justify going to war and using its superior military might against a smaller country in order to occupy it and bring peace to that country to the extent that it decides to interfere with military operations across its border. You can envision a world where the United States has a base, military bases all over the world, with bait, human bait, in all of those places and we have peace as a result because nobody would cross the border in order to harm somebody who was on essentially the same trading system. Not just the same deterrent system, but the same trading system. And that's what's happening now with, between Ukraine and Russia. We have a situation where the Russians, who again, march in, were the ones that marched into Berlin and liberated Germany from the Nazis. They don't have any American bases. That Lada car that I saw in Cuba, again, no U.S. bases over there. And when you look around, you start to realize if you're just going to join the military today, not in the past, but today, and your primary use will be bait in an overall scheme of deterrence, then propaganda starts to matter. Advertising starts to matter a lot more than the truth because no one's going to sign up to be bait. No one's going to sign up to be experimented on. And I don't mean the kind of uh, grotesque experiments you think of. A lot of very useful inventions are directly related to the military, not just because of DARPA, not, not obviously the internet, not just because of the RAND, the RAND Institute, but just simply because when you have essentially hostages who don't have freedom of movement, who are stuck in one place and who have to do what they're told. What ends up happening to those people is they get to you be used in a way that allows entities to gather data on them. So take stainless steel. I, whenever I can, I buy stainless steel products. Why? They last a long time. They keep liquid hot. They're very useful. Well, guess what? This probably goes back to World War II, and maybe even earlier than that, when the military realized before the advent of consistent supply chains and a reliable procurement system. You, the military, when you talk about military grade, 
then you had to last. Because if they didn't, you just never knew when a snowfall would prevent another shipment from reaching the troops. Again, that doesn't apply anymore. We're using drones now. We're using remote surveillance based on the internet, internet technology that the American military helped create. So, in a sense, if you join the United States military today, you're being used as bait and someone to experiment on to create better products. It's not a coincidence that the Volkswagen was, is now a car. It's using manufacturing processes. There's a movie, I believe, it's called Ford versus something. And in that movie, they talk about how during wartime, Ford Motor Company's plants were used to manufacture tanks. Again, the interchangeability of manufacturing, of parts, all that goes back to a, a steady and consistent effort to perfect supply chains. But you can't say that to somebody if you're trying to recruit them in an all-volunteer military. You can't say, well, you're gonna be stationed over here without much freedom in a country that claims that you're fighting for freedom. And we're gonna use you as bait. And on top of that, we're gonna study everything you do so that we can figure out not just how to control behavior, but what products work and what don't work. We have a lot of money. We get a trillion dollars every year. We can make mistakes up and down the chain and fix them because we have essentially an automatic funding guarantee regardless of whichever political party is in power. And no one else gets that. So go back and forth, and you realize that's not a selling point. So you have to come up with terrorism. You have to come up with propaganda. And then whenever you have an all-volunteer situation, to, make, to link that kind of service with something more. And that's where history comes in. If you're Swedish, how do you recruit if you have an all-volunteer military? Yeah, we funded both sides. Get over it. That's one of the reasons why we're able to make such great products, including cyber security products. There's no question right now if you had to choose between a cyber security product, say in the Philippines, also occupied by the Americans, and the Swedes, you would have to go, regardless of your desire to help developing countries, you would have to choose the Swedish suite of products. Because at the end of the day, what matters is efficacy, things that work. And again, when you have bait, and you can use those people, not just for deterrence, but for product enhancements, for, to perfect manufacturing systems, within an overall desire to perfect supply chain systems, it just makes sense that everything we see around us is in some way tied to World War II and the treaties that happened afterwards. And remember, World War II didn't really end in 1945. There were still conflicts all over the world. Um, in, in Indonesia, the Dutch didn't want to let go of their corporate property in, in that country. So they kidnapped the future Indonesian president and took him to Jogja, or Jogjakarta. So this was going on throughout the 60s, which eventually led to, no surprise, a conflict in Asia, in Vietnam. China invaded Tibet in the 1950 or so to secure freshwater supplies, as important as oil. You don't have water, your soldiers are gonna die fairly quickly. Back then, you keep going. You've got a situation in Indonesia, in Surabaya, with the British having to basically driven out by villagers with sharpened bamboo sticks over essentially a misunderstanding, miscommunication. And then, then it really just dawns on you that propaganda and advertising are necessary to move forward and are necessary to create a sense of pride in one's nation, but are not necessary for the truth. Why does that matter? Why should that concern you? Because if we actually could access the truth, it would make things a lot easier.
but it would also allow governments to claim that they uphold principles. And when you do want to try to recruit people to an all-volunteer military, what would be a better way of recruiting the best and brightest than saying that we are going to use force only when necessary to uphold the principles that we claim, one of which is freedom and one of which is truth. And the two of them are necessary together and cannot be advocated separately. There is no government in the world today that can probably make that statement to anyone. And that's one of the reasons why religion is still with us. When you look at the world, it's not only a link backwards in terms of choices to World War II, it's also a constant battle between religious entities, especially the Catholic Church and governments. I mentioned Vietnam. The Vietnam War was an attempt by the Catholic Church to separate North and South Vietnam into a Northern Buddhist country and a Southern Catholic country. If you don't believe me, go back and look at who J whom JFK, a Catholic president, installed in power, and look at his who his brother was. And as you'll see that his brother was an archbishop in the Catholic Church. Um, go back and just think about Ireland. Why is there a North and a South? Why is it that Czechoslovakia is no longer one country? Look at the percentages religiously in Czechia and in Slovakia. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why is this the case? One of the reasons, again, is because governments just haven't had principles that they could consistently espouse and advocate, which makes sense if you only have a government, especially one competing with someone else, every four years or every two years <laughs> or every eight years. It's going to be hard to come up with principles that you can consistently get behind in a convincing way. But if your religion, that is precisely your selling point, your advertising, is that the government that you live under, that you operate under, is temporary. And that we, whether the Catholic Church, the Nation of Islam, the Baptist Church, the universities with which these religious entities are associated with, that we are infinite. We believe in something infinite. And this government that we operate under is temporary. We know it's temporary, not just because of war, but because of the shifting borders that have happened throughout our lives. And everywhere you go in these borders, you'll always notice some religious participation. Why? Because religion is global inherently. Once you have a principle based on an infinite duration, tied into a trade structure that allows you to link people across borders in a way that separates them or elevates them above borders, you have a superior advertising system compared to governments that are advocating patriotism within only one country. And the governments have tried to fix this, right? That's one of the reasons why you won't see anti-Swedish advertising in Scandinavia. The governments have tried to fix this by coming up with local trade agreements, ASEAN, uh, NATO, not really a trade agreement, but it's what the security of the trade agreements are based on. You go back and you start to realize that even with these security agreements, even with these new trade agreements, you still don't have enough principle-wise to compete with religion. And what's interesting, of course, is that religion itself is based on a lie for the most part. Of course, it comes up with laws and rules before we had courts and legislators. But ultimately, one of the defining features of religion is that you have to believe in something you can't see and can't prove. And that's fine, that's faith. But it should bother you. We can't see infinity either, but we know it exists. It should bother you that very few governments, even the ones on the right side of justice and war, it should bother you that none of them, except for perhaps Singapore and perhaps Norway, and there's some other small, small countries, it should bother you and none of them have been able to counter the influence of religion within their own borders. And that's when you realize that there's always been a conflict. Where do dissidents hide 
when governments change. They hide in churches, they hide in synagogues, they hide in mosques. That's not a coincidence. Go to Czechoslovakia or Czechia or go to Prague. There's a church where people who assassinated one of the Nazi leaders hid after that assassination attempt was botched. Well, actually it succeeded, but the propaganda out there told everyone that it failed. And so that caused some people to turn and give information that eventually led to the discovery of these would be, well, well no, they, they, it worked, of these British aided shooters against the German Nazis. You go around and again, it starts to dawn on you that communism versus capitalism is really only another term for multinational corporations operating across borders versus governments attempting to influence the same exact areas. And not just multinational corporations, but religious entities that don't pay taxes and are operating against those same multinational corporations for influence. And governments from politicians start to look even more alone when you realize what they're up against today. But it's always been that, that way. Look at the East India companies, which were taught in school that you've got, you know, it wasn't just the Dutch who had an East India company. It was obviously the British East India company. You know, these were governments unto themselves. They started taxing people in, I believe, the Bengal region in India. And that's actually why corporations, multinational corporations, have been, in many cases, more successful than governments. Because they've been able to say, they've been able to do things the governments themselves cannot do or could not do. The problem is, the governments that were tasked with regulating them so that they always acted in the public interest no longer seem to have the expertise to do so. So when you look back and you ask yourself, where are the principles? Why are politics all over the world, except in a few small places? Why are they failing? It's because of a lack of principles. But why do we have, why do we suffer from a lack of principles? And it's because of the choices I just mentioned. We don't really have choices. Those choices are based on history, are based on the trade agreements made from the blood in many cases, not just the volunteers, but of innocent civilians, and borders that were drawn haphazardly, that then led to more wars, the conflicts in which treaties were signed, that were not signed in good faith, that were used to rearm both sides to start another war later on. So you've got a failure of diplomacy, which has led to a failure of governmental and nonprofit institutions, the credibility of those institutions, which has led to the executive branch rising up in a way that favors not just the military, but multinational corporations. And it's always been that way when you study the British East India Company, when you study how explorations for the new world were financed. So if you're, even if you're a libertarian today, like myself, what you have to do is realize that what you're seeking is equilibrium. And that equilibrium has to be, in one sense, in the form of an efficient, honest, transparent government that has both credibility and knowledge because it, it acts based on principles. And those principles are what allow it to regulate multinational corporations and religious entities that are seeking the same types of influence. And you can see how or why China, a one-party state, has been so successful over the last 20 years compared to a more Republican form of government that requires checks and balances. If we're not gonna have a credible system of checks and balances, if we're just gonna have the military running things, well, it comes down to the integrity of the executive branch, not a system of checks and balances. And on that level, China has been wildly successful. It's avoided invading other countries since Tibet in the 1950s. At the same time, its main competitor, the United States, has done the opposite, spending trillions of dollars in the Middle East without much to show for it. 
<sighs> so if you are a libertarian, your goal now is equilibrium in a, a system that actually checks and balances all the major players in the country in which you live, which would include religious entities. And it should be easier to regulate those because they don't pay taxes. And the reason they don't pay taxes is because they're supposed to be non-political, or I should say apolitical. It should be easier to figure out whether those institutions are upholding the upholding their end of the bargain by spending a minimum percentage on charity. Same thing with nonprofits. Universities are also nonprofits. Are they spending a sufficient percentage of their endowment every year on making on the public good? Shouldn't be that difficult. Same thing with multinational corporations. Are they creating deals across borders in a way that prevents governments from regulating them effectively? Just think Panama Papers. Think finance. Money goes everywhere, but people don't. Capital is mobile, but labor is not. When you start to realize that banks profit off of war as well, that the financial system in this, in this country, whether JP Morgan or otherwise, has benefited from, again, World War II, it starts to make sense. The banking sector in this country has enabled a debt-based system rather than a tax-based governmental system, which of course means the vote of a banker or a bank shareholders is more powerful than the vote of an individual citizen. That means we've gone backwards. We've gone backwards to the time of the British East India Company when citizens didn't really have the right to vote, or at least not most of them. Of course, you had landowners. Land, you don't have to go back that far. You've got landowners in this country that were only allowed to vote. It starts to make sense that one citizen, one vote. Doesn't make, doesn't exist in a monarchy type system. It is opposed to a republic-based system of checks and balances. And how did the monarchy survive? It distracted its citizens or its residents or its subjects through carnivals and other circuses while giving bread. And that's where we are now. We've gone backwards. And the only way to get back is the principles of not just the French Revolution, but of humanity, of freedom, is to try to continue our quest towards not necessarily a more perfect government, but just one that's capable. That's where we want to start. Efficacy in a way that strengthens the individual, especially the, the individual's participation in his or her local community, over that of the influence of a bank or a financial institution when there's a conflict between the bank's goals, short-term goals, I should say, and the individual's long-term goals. And that's why people buy houses, right? You buy a house because you're going to be there, in theory, for your whole life, for decades. And corporations, especially now, can just pack up and go anywhere, especially because they are global. That's a good thing. That's a good thing that corporations are global. What's not a good thing is that countries and governments are not really global, despite the United Nations, despite diplomacy, not necessarily having been invented post-World War II, but because of the idea that you needed diplomacy to prevent not just war, but just the subjugation of human rights. Well, it turns out that you can have peace led by the banking system, but you're not going to have prosperity for the greatest number of people while maximizing human rights within that scenario. You have to have, again, a system of checks and balances that, <laughs> that doesn't necessarily prioritize efficacy, but understands that we're all on the same path towards, again, not perfection, but a functioning system that eventually gets to a balance. When you really think about it, it's always been about influence. 
And then the question is, how do you promote influence based on principles? And you have to have politicians that have credibility. You have to have politicians that act reasonably. Those politicians can't just act by themselves. In many cases, when they pass a law, they have to act through the judicial system. So you have, at its root, systems that are competing with each other to develop talent, especially talent that believes in integrity and acts with it. And what has happened over time in this country is that the political sector may think that it has integrity, it may think that it's doing the right thing, but for the most part, especially since we're running on debt-based governance with contracts and deals that are baked in to the point where even a, an entirely new administration can't come in and fix anything because of these contracts, 10-year, 20-year contracts, entitlements, obligations to pre-existing factions, you start to realize that there may be an incompatibility, an incompatible situation between a country or a state that runs on debt rather than taxes. And of individual rights. And the question is, where do you go from there? Because again, I've said this in the past, you don't want to go to a place where the most honest, credible countries are small, small ones, whether Singapore or Norway or Qatar, are small ones that have been on the right side of history, but have been unable to, but are unable to influence world affairs on their own. And what is the stake? There's nothing less than, I'm not gonna say democracy, but self-governance. Remember, if we live in a, in a system that's similar to a monarchy, where we are subjects, not necessarily of kings, but of banks and trading houses that are better at presenting choices to us or the illusion of choices to us. What we really need are systems that elevate based on principles and cooperation, especially within local communities. How do we get there? When you have so many pre-existing factions I don't know. I really don't know. I think that's part of the problem. All I can say is that you have to act in a way that seeks equilibrium in everything you do. Whether it's writing something, whether it's volunteering, whatever it is that you do, speaking, you have to seek equilibrium. And maybe you just, just maybe, you have to root for the underdog as well. Even if you know it's not going to make a difference in a system that has so many vested interests and so much debt. Well, maybe, maybe you move. Maybe you decide to travel a little bit more and tell more people about your experiences. In, a, in an honest way that makes it more difficult for the advertisers and the propagandists to do their job. Maybe you reach back and you start to kindle the spark, not just creativity, but truth through your own individual experiences and maximizing those experiences as much as possible across borders. And then maybe you'll start to be build the first brick or the second brick or the 10th brick of a new foundation that allows for some sort of equilibrium.